This is Siraj Barwani, Chief Strategy Officer at Lumen. Lumen is a journey advertising company. Uh, it's a public field company. And for those of you who are wondering what is journey advertising, well, the idea of customer journey marketing, as we know, right, has been talked about for at least 14 years. The first article was published in the Harvard Business Review by one of my colleagues, David Edelman. But since then, there's been a lot of development on how to actually activate and execute programs like that um, and so forth, right? Um, that's a whole different topic for another day. Um, today, we have far more exciting things to talk about, so let me tell you a few things that I researched uh, on um, Holland America. So, if we just go do a little search on Holland America and how popular it is, what people think of the brand, all of that, you're going to see a litany of awards just in the past two or three years, right? So here's the, the Cruise Critic, Best Service Award, there is Travel Weekly, Reader's Choice Award, there is Magellan Gold on the Grand World Voyage, um, the Best Alaska Cruise and Best Itinerary, you will see 17 others in there. And so, to get this kind of objective assessment, it's very, very hard to be able to do that. If you guys are sufficiently intrigued, let's go to Casey Cole and ask her about her background, first of all. So Casey, introduce yourself. Um, our audience here generally is very interested in knowing everyone. What are some of the highlights of your experience and what did you go through that helped you end up being in the world where you are in America? so that we get a little feel for that. Thank you. Of course. Why am I the mic? Because I have no inner voice, so if I blow everybody out, please let me know. Um, so I'm Casey Cole, I'm Chief uh, Marketing Officer for Holland America. I have two areas of responsibility. One is the very uh, classic marketing, where on everything soup to nuts, from acquisition to retention and loyalty, to indirect to direct channels, all that, the whole gamut. Um, and on the other side, I also own e-commerce. So I own the revenue responsibility um, for our e-commerce flows, which there are three of. And so um, I really feel, like I think I told you this, I've manifested this job. It's been um, absolutely incredible. You know, I really came up, I started in content, and when I, I'm gonna age myself here, when I came out of business school, the web was looking for publishers. So it was really a publishing form. And so, I spent the next few years really rolling up through the digital side of performance marketing, digital web, and all those good things. And so um, it's really when I got into retail about 15 years ago that I really started to understand more the brand. And so um, I think it all culminated together for me as a T-Mobile doing brand and performance together. And those two things have really led to a passion for me, um, which is like bringing the brand and performance together to my strongest market. Uh, I think the other piece is that, um, you know, I um, I also feel like I've really learned so much around the performance side, but how do I now do transformation around that? So usually transformation is associated with digital transformation. This is my fifth digital transformation. I love it. It's great. But on the other side of that, um, it's really a brand transformation as well. And this brand's 150 years old. Uh -huh. so. How do we evolve that? So that's been, for me, such an exciting opportunity. And um, we have, I mentioned to you previously, before the pandemic, we were kind of on a slope, a decline. And, um, and then, like many travel folks, went through a really hard time through the pandemic and have come out um, not just successful, but like wildly successful, like the second strongest brand in the world. So, Perfect. So. Perfect. So clearly, you mentioned that already for a 150 year old. It had to have some basic strengths that are associated with it. It's a story brand, right? Um, how did you make your assessment when you first came there? Yeah. What did you see as the strengths? Then what did you anticipate as the opportunities that got you all excited about? Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, first it is 150 years old. There's tradition there, like really good tradition, and heritage of DNA. Um, that's like pretty incredible, and it, and it flows through the crew and the people on board as much as it is also the And so they have incredible itineraries, they're really known for that, we were known for a long itineraries, 
And the other big piece was in Alaska. So Alaska, we were sailing to Alaska before Alaska was even a state. And I think that was one of our things, like how do we really want to win? In order for us to win as a brand, we have to win in Alaska. So I think the first thing is always listen. And so you really listen and learn what the brand is like. But um, the most important thing for me were who is the guest? And I think we thought we knew who the guest was, but we didn't really know who the guest was. So we did a tremendous amount of research there. Second thing is differentiation. How do we be different in a highly competitive market and something that's very ownable and relatable by us? Um, and not alienate poor customers, but invite new in. So on that topic, I think uh, you reminded me that we were having conversations earlier last week, is everything starts with the audience, right? Mm -hmm. Let's talk about that. Who is your most like avid fans of the brand? Yeah. And then from there, on, where do you talk about so all those segments are? Yeah. How you learn about the insights? Um, well, we definitely had a core segment, but we went through and actually identified five segments that were really relevant um, to our business. And we did the traditional demographic and psychographic uh, data, but really, what made us able to find common ground and grow is appending the transactional bias, which is basically what brands do they shop? You know, what, where do they spend their free time? What are they buying? And when you apply that to your core opportunity segments, you can see where they're similar and where they're different. And so we learned, regardless of whether you're taking a seven day cruise, you're doing a round the world 12 months with us, that this um, set of data that you're a lifetime learner, that you want to be relaxed, you want service that's non performative, which basically means non white glove service. You want that feels very genuine. They recognize you by name, you know, they remember what you drank, and that could even be, by the way, cruise to cruise. And so we really started repositioning the brand to be, I like the word contemporary versus modern, but it started to be more contemporary and really looking at how do we want to leverage that third party data to make smarter and smarter decisions. The third piece of that I would just say is that, um, you know, really the company is very siloed, it's just how they work. So even my marketing department, I had six departments, they all put their own plans, they never really planned together. And it was the same thing with actually the ship. So one of the big changes we've made on the marketing front is we partner very closely with what's going on in the onboard product. What should that be? What does that look like? So that the promises and communications we make in marketing are actually paying off on board. Perfect. So on that topic, so I think the way you're talking about it, we discussed the idea of the value of the data a lot in the platform. Yeah. How you should be using it, how you should be, you know, looking at that in only a time because you know it moved, the world is moving faster and all that stuff, right? But I think the big message I take away from you is that data is about what you own but also what comes from elsewhere because the life that a customer is spending with your brand is a small, narrow window into their life versus everything else that they do elsewhere. So the way you described it is if you match it and get a better view of them, it leads to insights that you would otherwise not get. Okay, so what was the result of that? The result of that was, I have, a, I, have a, I have a question about which I've heard a lot in the news stories, mm -hmm. which is this whole port to play program, mm -hmm. the whole specialty and the fish around which you actually develop the whole onboard product. What was the strategy behind it? And how did this whole thing come about? Yeah. So, um, as part of our research, first thing we looked at is what is actually driving the bookings. So on our side, Food & Bev was actually the biggest onboard product driver and the only one really influencing it. So we knew we wanted to focus there. So when we looked at the third party data, we saw things that guests, the number one restaurant guests were uh, frequenting was Bonefish. The second was Roy's. Their top 10 grocery items had fresh fish. We also over-indexed, rightly so in Alaska, was selling fresh fish dishes. And so we looked at our supply chain and came up with a new program that actually is better um, on all around, including for our business, to be able to locally source fish and fresh fish. So we will source it in a port and serve it on plate for 20, 48 hours. And that was, and that's done in 80 ports around the world, and um, we're going to continue to grow it, and it's pretty incredible. And I mentioned to you, there's a wonderful magic in marketing to take something like, um, you know, supply chain and really go forth with that. 
Um, in addition to that, we want to integrate and grow also um, offshore. So we want to stay in touch. So we're now launching, we are going to be on a season of Top Chef around fresh fish. So we did media integrations. We we're doing launching our own products. So one of the other insights for our guests was their heavy catalog shoppers. So we partnered with Harry and David, which is their number one catalog purchaser. And we're creating, uh, we created Holland America Fresh Fish that you can get at home now. Um, and we're getting ready to launch cooking classes with a partner and can't get named. So really, we're really taking something that's part of their life, making it for a board. And the output of that is, oh, I should mention, we also um, partnered with Chef Morimoto. He's our Fresh Fish Ambassador to do both a pop-up and a uh, full um, restaurant on one ship that we're not going to expand because it's so successful. It sells out the fastest. And uh, we have now, because of this program and the demand for it, over 60% of all the digital import of fresh fish. And that's like incredible. I mean, I wasn't even close to that. So we're really seeing incredible success with it, and it's a great way to grow the brand without having to spend many dollars to the same degree. I was just going to get to that. <laughs> I that, still was a, that was a big that was a big message I took away from this whole thing. It's because there's something really interesting about how you have built this out, right? Yeah. The, the the experience is the product that you really get to see. Very much so. I believe brand is experience now. It used to be a promise, it used to be a lot of things. Brand for me is about experience. Absolutely. Exactly. And so you've taken that and you've really blown it out there mm -hmm. to the point where it is recognizable, is easily understandable. Mm -hmm. That's what people love to do. Mm -hmm. And so you've sort of brought it home, so to speak, right? It's made yeah. an entire lifestyle around. Very much, I, we are a lifestyle brand. We may not be showing it just yet, but we are absolutely a lifestyle brand. And I think that's where we really want to lean into. And, and also, you know, I think I mentioned this to you earlier, you know, there's a lot of focus on cruising on demographics. And when I first started, I was asked, like, what do I think about that? And I said, well, you know, I think demographics are a bit dead. And yes, you have generations, boomers and Gen Zs and all the things, but really, if you were to go to Four Seasons Hotel, it's my example I'd love to give, and there's somebody who's 70 at the pool, and there's somebody who's 20 at the pool. The 70-year-old is not wondering why the 20-year-old's at the pool or vice versa. They're there because it was commonality and interest in luxury, and they want a certain level of service. And so that's, in my mind, the approach. How are we building a brand around something that connects people, whether you're doing a seven-day adventure uh, cruise to Alaska or whether you're sailing around the world for six months? or anything in between, and those things are in common. Fresh Fish was a good first step for us. In that Excellent. Area. Fantastic. Yeah. You know, you, you've seen books, you know, from some of the biggest authors who run hospitality, mm -hmm. a restaurant like that, those mm -hmm. guys, right? And they talk about things like the unthinkable hospitality. Mm -hmm. I read the book, it's great. Yeah, exactly, right? They're talking about how do you deliver things that consumers sort of get above and beyond what they would expect from you. Mm -hmm. And I think what you did here is not just that, but I think you did something else here, which is you took a very hard thing that people imagine, this whole supply chain and the, the fresh fish thing. It's hard. That's the reason why other cruise lines can't do it so easily. And you made it look so easy, so seamless and all that. That's magical, right? Mm -hmm. That's fantastic. Um, I have to give a shout out to the F and B people, the food and team people. We're one hundred. It's a team sport. Of is course. what we do. We talk about marketing is a team sport. Yes. And, and it really, without their partnership, it's like absolutely. Not I completely get it. It's, but it's really more about pulling that all the way to the market. Um, right? It's insight driven marketing. Actually, we have not had. Exactly. And certainly, this organization, we have not had a lot of that. So it's great to see that not only connecting. At the front end, which often happens in a strategy, and then it kind of falls apart, that we're pulling it all the way through, including post cruise. And I think that's what's making it. Okay, so this so is how the brand is being built. Are you guys with me so far? Where are we going with this thing? Okay, let me take you to the next step now. We're going deeper into the business now. Let's talk about distribution channel. Okay. okay. So last year, the journal, Wall Street Journal, actually did research. Uh, and took like 1,200 travelers out of there and asked them the question. Uh, had to do with how many of them actually book their own travel themselves. And the number was 78%. Okay, classic 80-20. Roughly 80% of the people are actually booking their own travel, right? In general, it wasn't just about cruising, it was anything. Um, how much of this applies in the cruise business? 
Um, some, for sure. I mean, I think that um, for us, it's a little different because cruising is actually a very complex business. So um, we, so right now, I am um, selling 24 season, 25 season, and opening 26 to sell 26. I am marketing um, Alaska and Europe and Asia to Americans. I'm marketing Alaska and Caribbean and uh, Asia to Europeans. I mean, it's just, and then there's also three booking flows. So this was my big learning when I came in. You know, I have GM in charge of bookings, but that's just the first hurdle. After that, you've got to get people through drink packages, and short excursions, and spa appointments, and dinner reservations. And then on the other side, it's actually service on board. So we actually have three booking flows to manage through the guests, regardless of how they're sourced. So it's actually, it's really complex and sometimes like makes my teeth itch. It's like a lot to manage, but on the other side, you know, it's really exciting for me, all boats rise, right? So how my approach to digital is really about growing the business. So we still have travel agents because when you're going around the world for six months or 12 months, you want sometimes someone. And then we have people in house who can also do that as well. But the goal is how do we take digital and make everybody's life easier? So whether you want to book on your own, let the customer serve what they want, they want to go to agent, how do we help them make sure they get the support they need to get on board? And that's really my larger approach. Got it. Got it. With me so far? Mm -hmm. Okay. There's a lot going on here because in your case, the agents, you know, there is a, there's a general feeling in the marketplace that says the travel agency is dead. But the fact of the matter is, in this particular case, and the type of servicing that you're trying to provide, they actually have an amazing role. Right. Yeah, I think it's a really neat place right now too, where um, you know, okay, our web business is more than quadruple. Like I'm not gonna lie, I take great pride in that. It's been like amazing yeah, yeah, as a yeah, direct yeah, channel, yeah. and our direct business as an overall percent has also grown. So of our percent of bookings, web is definitely the buyer. But you know what happened in the pandemic is um, thirty to fifty thousand travel agents left, whether they didn't have business, they retired early, etc. So now you have a whole new, about 20,000 new travel agents who come in. And so this industry has really flipped over. So that is starting slower than everything else. You new, still, kind of new generation of people. Whole new generation and problem. people who survived what was, you know, nearly the annihilation of their business. And so, you know, I really take great pride in how do we use digital to help them too and make that part of the process. Because this is an industry that's going to be around for a while. So Perfect. I think like that's a big part of how we can leverage digital technology to help all boats rise and help grow our business regardless of the channel. Understood. The next logical question here, as you know, is going to be about the audience itself. Mm -hmm. It's like growth, is it coming significantly from your existing base? Who loves, like my sister, who's cruising most of the time, uh, and then there are those who are new with new experience and so forth, right? Um, if you listen to Byron Sharp, you're a marketer, you've heard of it. The guy's been spending 20 years out there at the Ambassador Institute in Australia. He calls all his work evidence-based marketing. It's very empirically driven, amazing data set. He'll tell you to grow the brand, you must go and bring in new customers. That's the best way to grow the brand. But when I'm thinking of your business, how do you think of it? Is it that most of the driving is coming from the existing base, of whom you know a lot, you know their taste, you know their love, a lot of itineraries, or are you also trying to bring in new generations? Both, of course. <laughs> okay. uh, so, when our existing customers, they were the first to come back to us after the pandemic, right? Because okay. they knew us, they're comfortable with us. There were still so many restrictions that we didn't have in comparison to airlines and hotels, etc. Um, so, um, they were the first to come back. And um, I think that we use this time also to crystallize who the guest is. And that third party data that I mentioned is also great because you don't. You don't think, when you go target someone, I don't think I know who, you know, Jeff Jones is. I know it's Jeff Jones, and I'm going after him on the media side. So we have actually really tremendously grown our business with the next kind of generation, a big influx of new, who are trying us, especially around Alaska. Alaska's where we over-index a new guest. So we really use that as a new funnel to help bring people along. Then there's a second part of guests who were really nervous to cruise, that were poor guests. And, 
So we really are working to bring back things that they really love about the brand. We're talking about Holland American traditions that they really connected with so that they feel more comfortable coming back and do big win back push. But it's a bit of a balance. Um, you know, our business has seven day cruises and it has the around the world and we have a lot of longer cruises and those are for people who retire that could take the time. I would love to do that, but, but like, uh, I can't, but we, uh, we have seven, 10, 21 day. And those are things that, you know, everyone can do. So that's for us like where we really need to bring in consistency and really not just getting people to try the first, it's really getting people to try the second. Understood. So you almost have something of the effect of the way B&G thinks about it. It's uh, brand marketing. They have what they call the point of entry market. That they are trying to bring people into sort of the younger generation to expose them to the green tea portfolio. I think you have shorter cruises and things like that, mm -hmm. sort of thing in that mm -hmm. so you, you build that up. The reason I was going down that line of reasoning is because it came to from the channel. The fact that your digital channel is actually growing so fast, mm -hmm. it is my feeling that it has something to do with the newer audiences who are more passive and love the digital and all of that, so potentially that's also quite consistent in the way you've aligned it together. Yeah. Now we'll say, you know, the cruise, you're not going to buy a $50,000 cruise and yeah. maybe check out on the web, but, you know, we do a few, I'm not a lie, which is exciting, but, um, you know, I think, you know, we really think about the channels, where is the guest, how do they want to hear from us, where they want to be served, these are all the things we always talk about, but it's been able for us with such a diverse audience to actually really get focused on you know, the, uh, we call them relaxing silvers. These are the retirees who really cruise all year, whether it's one or six. Um, and they really do like the direct mail because the cruises are longer and they want to read about it and think about it and understand more of that. They do a tremendous amount of research, so we lean into that. But we've had great success on the media front with storytelling and video, and that has been able also to reach not only those relaxing silvers on, you know, um, Prime and Hulu and Paramount sure, and such, yes. but really the younger people and really tell a fun story. There's one unique thing around the brand that makes us more like CPG, which is we're very multi-generational. So in fact, I have personal friends from Texas whose grandparents took them on um, and now they're taking their kids. And so we have a lot of like, you know, a good probably like 10 to 15% is the grandparents bring the parents, parents bring the kids and then the cycle comes start so over. Multi-generational multi is huge for us. And so I think that's really neat. It's a special thing that I haven't seen with any other brands outside of CPG where, you know, whatever your family used, do you use. And you kind of start from there and that's been a really exciting thing that we're leaning into and it's, it's about 40% of our booking start coming from that. Oh, that's nice. That's, that's impressive. Yeah. yeah. Right. Um, that leads to the final question. Mm. With all of the work that you've done in building up the brand, getting reviews independently by the critics in the world out there, <coughs> travel you know, writers and so forth, where do you see the brand as it is today? And how does that influence a debate that we've been having at BI for the past few years, which is how are you deciding on your allocation between branding and performance? Um, I don't decide because they go together. That's my personal point of view is that uh, I think we as marketers have, we were not accountable for, I mean, I've been around a while. We always have a lot of metrics. Now we have all the metrics, like so many, but um, you know, there is an element that you need to do, but you need to do branding. You need to do performance marketing and they're best together. I think T-Mobile is an amazing example of that. And that's been my view in building this marketing department over the past three years is how do we do that together? So we can tell an emotional story and make an emotional connection and also offer value, put up an offer, like, you know, bring people further down the funnel. And I think we found that wildly successful. Um, and I think I mentioned this to you, which is last year we broke a single day sales history record for the company of 150 years at our highest day of sales. Uh, and then we broke it again in January. So um, it's a really, it does a massive team effort, but I, I, I think that the brand and performance has to go together. Right now they compete in so many organizations and, and it's hard, it's a shift. And um, But I think bringing those two together is the best approach and where I think I've had the most success. That brings us to journey in advertising and marketing. There you go. <laughs> Perfect. The whole thing sort of plays together, right? Exactly. Absolutely. The interaction yes. that goes on. Yes. Okay. I can speak with her for another hour. 
Yeah. Because I we have have both tons of questions. <laughs> we love it. We've had a great time you know, getting to know each other. But I'd like to open it up to the floor. You guys have any questions? If you don't, I will ask you questions. I have a question. <laughs> what cruises have you gone on? And what, which ones were your favorite? We knew that was going to come up. I feel like someone asked. So, <laughs> Um, so on Holland, I think my favorite is Alaska. I'm, I love the outdoors, and it's a special place you can really only get to um, by cruise, or if you do land, if you want an authentic experience, you can go live in a tent and do those things. But like we um, have been sailing here since we're um, four, Alaska was actually state, so we have all these like deep relationships, and we really connect you with like great authentic stories and experiences. Our focus is our number one uh, thing for guests is glaciers and wildlife. So we've really built all of our itineraries around that and then complemented by the Fresh Fish program was saying. So Alaska is my favorite. I could do it over, I could do it all summer. Um, I wish they would let me. We also, by the way, have a land tour, which is really neat. And that's something that makes us very different where we have a lodge in Denali. So you're right at the gates of the park, so you can do a cruise and then do a land tour and then come back around. And so that's also something that makes us really different. Yeah, the only thing is, you can't get that booking this year. It's not finished. <laughs> right? uh, we're almost done this year. Yeah, yeah, we haven't yeah. even started the season, and we're yeah, so that's okay, crazy. Exactly. All right. Other questions? There, over there at the back. Have you, um, in your time, have you had to change your loyalty program and your loyalty strategy um, across the team? And I know it's probably always shifting. I'm just curious what it was and where it's going. Yeah, we have a loyalty program that I would say is outdated. It's on the agenda for this year. Um, and I think it's very focused on giveaways, and um, which I think in some instances devalues the service, right? It's like how you think about it. So we're in the process of reevaluating that to see like where, where do we want to put that effort. Um, you know, I think part of where it needs to come together is the digital journey part that we're still hacking through our lot of old systems. So we're trying to get off of that onto new ESPs and new triggers and all that good stuff so that we can handhold more through the process. And there'll be a lot of AI part of that conversation, but um, I think we have to revamp it and see what's really important and try to find that common ground. Um, we have a presence club that's got about 250 people and they're the ones who really have most of the benefits. But, you know, I think the opportunities to get from that one star mirror, so we call it to like a two star, which basically means you risk once or twice and keep going. But it needs a lot of work, and I think we have to figure out, we use that data to figure out what's going to make it really interesting to people, so I just freak out. Uh, thank you very much. Um, so you mentioned the excitement with the $50,000 uh, online purchase. Uh, <laughs> uh, and that's probably not very common. Uh, I know a lot of folks are trying to do that. But how do you move uh, those customers from that connection point in the yeah. digital space to actually picking up those well? Yeah, I mean, I will just say, if I can give a little more context there, too, which is, um, you know, our when I first started, the majority of the business on the web was I'm booking it and I'm sailing within 30 days, and I'm saying like 80%. We're now a third buy it and sail within 90 days. A third are buying and sailing within three to six months, and then the other third is doing more than six months out. And for that to happen in two and a half years, I mean, web people, that's pretty dramatic shift and so for us there's a couple of things one is we look at we have within our crm systems look at where you're sourced so we have made a big shift to partnering closer with our travel agents so that they know their customers getting handholding these are the communications they expect because sometimes there's fear right on the travel agent side that like oh we don't want holland taking the customer right so we recognize it's them and so they kind of ride the journey with the guest right so and then two is we are really bringing the marketing and the web together. So if you think about text, push notifications, emails, with a really strong my account functionality, that's where we're going. So how do we have like a, a hub and spoke model? Here's all your information. It can be across nine systems, but it all gets built into one place. And then we trigger you how you want to be communicated to, let's say text, your morning pass is ready, right? It always goes back to place. So that's where we're at it. In fact, I'm headed to Seattle yeah, tonight to go work on more of that. But that's where we're going is that whole like what we call pre-cruise from the post from the moment you post book to the moment you get on board there's a lot of things that have to happen and so we're actually using um ai technology which i can't quite talk about yet but we're getting there to really handhold people through and that and that pre-cruise is everybody wherever you're buying from whether you bought direct or bought the travel agent you need to go through the pre-cruise so you can get 
things you want to avoid, right? And so we're really trying to enhance that. I think to the to, to connect with the question that gentleman or that had, which is once you have these systems integrated with a single account, mm -hmm. it's so much easier to also execute on work programs yeah. and how you incentivize people mm -hmm. and all of that, right? So I think it's, it's kind of connected, right? We're gonna wrap it up here, okay? Let me let me summarize it with some of the biggest lessons that we learned from UKC today. One is a successful CMO today has to do a lot more than what we used to know 20 years ago, right? They used to be the big idea people, they were the big brand people, they did all of those things. And then we said, oh well, you know, we also need to sell stuff besides the idea, so we need to get the chief growth officers to go do it drive growth and get more revenue. In your case, you're responsible for sales targets as well. So here we have Casey, who's responsible for not just branding, but performance and the whole thing with clear accountability tied to yourself, right? So that's just one part of the basic business function. There's more than that going on here, which is you are diving into the experience itself which influences the product. So today, CMOs also are responsible for making sure that the product is shaped in a way that has some inherent advantages to go out there and grab organic viewership and attention, which of course helps you significantly in reducing the burden on the paid media side of it. So that you have to do. At South by in Austin last week, I had a CMO who's responsible for now driving a culture so that they could attract new talent from the marketplace. Again, CMOs are moving into how do you really create employee culture as well, right? Do you see where this is going? It's like there is a hunger for leadership and just about everything gets put on the CMO's lap. You go solve the problem of all communications that happen outside and inside the company. You see where I'm going? This is Renaissance marketing. This is what the future CMO is. And we are so excited that you came here to speak about it. Because for the audience to see that kind of leadership, we need more of this in our industry. So thank you so much for taking the time.